Totally. Every time the yeah. axon crosses the needle, like, one has to go over the other. Maybe that was lost the time. Uh, so today I'd like to talk about the, uh, the better formation. So the challenge uh, is that uh, try to uh, understand more how uh, geometry in the physics uh, contribute to morphogenesis. So I will uh, try to uh, take the talk into four sections. First, I will introduce you about the better morphogenesis. Uh, in development and also in adult feather regeneration. So you get a perspective about feather. And then I will use three, three examples to show how geometry and physics uh, uh, can combine to help the feather pattern formation. So the first one we introduce the, uh, the feather hypothesis. I think one of the most remarkable things is that the, they almost go through an organ level metamorphosis, such as the frigate bird, uh, when they were young, it looks like this, and the adult, it looks like this. Uh, it's because as a baby, they need warmth, and they don't that like to be attractive. Uh, but then as they grow into a cow, they have to fry, catch the bird, a fish, and also to the bird. And the female doesn't have this pouch. So these process uh, goes through, uh, that we, that's why we use the chicken as a model. The small young chicken looks like this, and the rooster and hen looks like this. And actually, uh, to justify what the NIH grant, this also happened in human. Uh, because as teenagers, you grow beard, and as adults, some of us actually lose hair. And indeed, the hair stem cell has been shown to be generally normal. It is a niche, the niche, stem cell niche, that is, uh, is changed and the long is harder to sex off well. So you grow here, here, but you come out of your hair. Uh, so then we justify uh, feather with a good model. Uh, so that uh, we try to understand that it's more this organization principles. So so I sort of through my career uh, working on this, and uh, uh, the feeling is that first you have to take a unit, make it a periodic pattern. So you make multiple units. Second, each multiple unit has its own stem cells, so it can renew its life. With this possibility, you can have a, a diversification, such as downy feather of the body, fried feather of the wing, tail feather uh, to look good. Uh, but also, uh, different uh, timing, you can uh, go through the change. So you have this diversification, and then go through the wound regeneration and the evolution aspect. So the basics, uh, they also start uh, from a plug called epithelial mesenchymal interaction. They grow into a short feather bud, elongate a long bud. At this stage, it's, it's interesting is that the, such as in the deep bud, the growth point is actually of the ADR continue to grow. Then later regeneration requires the differentiation. But in feather and hair at this stage, they switch. They make their stem cell go downstairs under the follicle. So every time the differentiation one goes away, they can regenerate another feather follicle. And then they go through this feather cycle. <coughs> and uh, that, uh, so that uh, uh, they were able, in the baby time, uh, grow this downy feather. But in the adult feather on the body, they grow the bilateral symmetry. Come to feather, and then the fried feather has to be bilateral asymmetry. And another thing that are unique about the birds is that the, they take their body domain and make them into multiple trucks. So now different trucks can grow different type of the feather. And we were able to also use this uh, uh system, such as convert a bilateral symmetric feather into a radial symmetric feather, just using digital. Actually, in this case, it was wind gradient, you wipe it out. You can either take DKK1 to flatten out, the, <coughs> to lower the, the gradient, or you overexpress wind to, to raise the gradient. In both cases, you can convert the bilateral symmetry into the radial symmetry. <coughs> and this feather branch, though, is actually formed in a very interesting way. Um, it was originally a feather cylinder. Then they formed these barb widgets. And so this is actually can sort of a, in a way uh, that uh, parallel to the gut formation, you know. 
and they quit working on all these things. And uh, and then the, the cells in between will die. And then at the uh, higher magnification level, each one of them is actually the basal layer is on the top here. Then they start to form these uh, barb ridges. Uh, and the, <coughs> the cells, barb ridges, after that, then this area continue to grow. This area will die. The dark blue area will die. That's called marginal brain. And uh, uh, this brain is all continue to grow, grow out as, as, as the bar. And another place that's going to die is the light blue area called the axial brain. So eventually, you have this part continue to grow. This dark blue would become the space between bars. This light blue would become space between bar. <coughs> so it goes go through such a very nice pattern the cell death, then the, the, <coughs> the branching uh, is established. Uh, this is in contrast to mammary blood or in kidney, where the branching morphogenesis is, <coughs> is a through differential growth, but this is a through differential cell death. Uh, <coughs> so, so with this kind of process, uh, within each fetal follicle, there is another word. So we usually call it the pattern over the body, macro pattern. And within the feather, we call it the micro pattern. Uh, you have a stem cells here, and then they go up to form uh, another level of a fantastic <coughs> spot or stripes uh, pattern. Uh, that, uh, and uh, that uh, we have shown that there is a Milano, a Milano size stem cells there. But for the bird, the white feather can <coughs> not like human. White, white hair is gone, you know, all your stem cells are out. But in the bird, they can control uh, their stem cells. So sometimes they can be white in one season and brown in another season because they can control the migration of the, of the stem cells. So that's another pattern process. And another wonderful pattern process is that the, the color is not only the pigment cell in the bird. It's also controlled by the structural color and the chemical color. So in the majority, you go to the pet store, all these colors and how do they come from? It's actually, in addition to the brain, which comes from the Milano side, they have this blue and, and blue and the, the, the green yellow. So the blue color turns out to be controlled by the structural color. Without the, this structural color component, it's white. Otherwise, it's blue. Another one is the chemical color, this direction. So if you have the chemical color, and the, you, the, that is the enzyme uh, that the uh, uh, clone actually uh, through the Stamentes group, uh, that uh, they give you the yellow color. So if the yellow uh, meets the, the, the white, you got yellow. And then the yellow meets the blue, you got green. So that's how you got all these colors, three components. And the, also the aguti actually goes to the mesen camera cell. So where would this enzyme come from? So actually, it turns out it's of this axial plate cell that I just mentioned. And those are the cells in between the barbules. So this enzyme, accordingly, was originally all over the body. But in this bird, they happen to go to, well, not happen, but whatever evolution happened, they go to the axial plate. So they produce the yellow pigment to give it to the other <coughs> barbule cells, and then they die. Uh, so, so that's how this uh, mechanism come from. And then there is uh, this evolution aspect. Uh, that, that as you can see, uh, <coughs> this cytosoporteryx <coughs> all looks just the whole body, the downy feather. And this one is not big. It's the real force is about this size. And uh, <coughs> that um, they just keep warm. They don't even have a different tract. And then they start to evolve. Uh, this one still cannot fly, and this can ride. Not really the error engineer price. So there is a lot of the situation here. You can also mm -hmm. see how the environment would, would shape the feather, uh, just like the big talk uh, Aha just mentioned. That kind of <coughs> principle in the operation. Okay, so now go to the next topic. Uh, we talked about the pattern formation. So from Sangeo's classical book, uh, book, you can see this still very beautiful feather. <coughs> You can see there is a dorsal tract here, a femoral tract here, and a scapular tract here. Uh, but interestingly, instead of the midline here, you have the feather bud propagated bilaterally. 
And you can also see they are pointing this direction, pointing a certain direction. So these are the issues. I want to, today, you know, we're not going to talk about tender. I want to talk about embryo development. Uh, so first, I just update uh, some of our recent understanding about this pattern formation. Uh, we know something already, but I think recent progress has helped form. And the second is about the some of these collective orientation. <coughs> so that uh, the further uh, periodic patterning um, that um, we and others have shown earlier that the uh, reaction diffusion mechanism is in operation during feather pattern. Um, that uh, and as you know, like the activator, activate the activator, then a long range inhibitor can inhibit. Um, so earlier we just talked about this morphogen, FGF wind, uh, work as uh, as the as the, the mediator. But subsequent work by uh, Kondo uh, working on fish, zebra fish stripes, uh, show that uh, you don't have to have a diffusible activator. Uh, the cell adhesion, either a higher affinity or a repulsion, can work as Turing activator inhibitor. So Kondo called that the Turing without diffusion, uh, which turns out to be actually uh, expand uh, the significance here. And also now uh, that uh, Shire and also Hatton, uh, they start to show the mechanical uh, chemical uh, coupling is also involved in this process. Uh, but I want to talk more about this propagation issue. Uh, because when we look at in vivo, we can see the feather, but this is the end cap standing. So they start from the midline, then they go bilateral, go bilateral. So you can see there is this zone, which is morphogenetic zone. So you have a morphogenetic zone spreading bilaterally. So they actually form sequentially from the midline uh, to bilateral in vivo, in vivo. But our <coughs> lab try to do this uh, tissue engineering type thing. So we start to play with the in vitro situation very early ago, but I think the recent work gives some of the new answer to this old experiment. If you take the whole piece of the skin expert, these lines here, you still have them form <coughs> bilateral sequentially. But if I take the epithelium, I dissociate all the mesenchymal cells. They are competent to make patterns. So I put them under this epidermal sheet. Now, the curing still happen, but now they appear at the same time. They all come up at the same time. Because in a way, you think about that, the curing, I think the way they define it is supposed to be, the field is supposed to be symmetric, not like the symmetric field. And so they just appear all at the same time. So that, um, and then at that time, we also try to find out what could control the process. So the experiment allows us to take the epidermis and they give different number, different number of the mesenchymal cells. We find out that there is actually a threshold for the tubing pattern to begin. So at the lowest cell density, they just appear one here, one there, one there, and they appear more and more. So when you reach the so-called hexagonal pattern, it is not by a blueprint design. It is actually because it's the highest packageable density. Uh, so when it's reached this shoulder, they, they, they look like hexagonal, but it's, it's because they can pack as many feather buds uh, as possible. Uh, and not hexagonal. But this is not a perfect hexagonal either. But basically, we can appreciate it's a cell density is doing something to allow the theory uh, to, to, to happen. <coughs> so in 1999, we actually proposed it that the period, the, the propagation wave uh, comes from the combination of two events. One is a fueling pattern, which is a local event, and, uh, and the things will happen just at any place and at the same time. And let's actually also explain Davis and have a work. In the early time, he asked the same question, and he make a cut here. <coughs> if there is a propagation, then the new bud will not appear. But the new bud will appear after a while. So let's say you have a local event. These cells are capable of doing pure. On the other hand, in vivo, you do have this beautiful propagation wave. So where they come from? Uh, so we, we propose there is a global event. But I don't know what they are. Uh, we know it's related to cell density. Uh, and then the local event uh, kick in. Uh, 
but the, uh, so recently uh, there's this work uh, uh, by Hayden's group, uh, Dennis Hayden's group. Uh, they basically show, they basically show there is an EDA wave on the epidermis at the time spread out uh, from the midline by that term. They will then induce FGF20. And this FGF20 is also very interesting. He got this idea because there is a bird called the scaleless. Uh, some of you might know. It's not completely scaleless. It's actually the mid line is there. Initial row is there because the initial row is made by a different mechanism, but they do not propagate. So, so when the, he put it together, show EDA can induce FGF20, which then enhance the cell aggregation, and also through uh, Shire's group and Oster's classical work, talking about the mechanical force can actually help induce the feather formation. So for quite a while, we have these different uh, finding and not able to integrate them. But I think actually it looks pretty good now with these different finding. Is that the, the midline is here and this is the cell density. But then when EDA comes along, you create a small morphogenetic field. Within that field, within that field, you so-called lower the, 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 the threshold to kick in the curing pattern. So, at least more curing pattern would happen only in this blue zone. And that's how they give you also that exquisite pattern. And then they spread, and then they spread. Can you and define then, EDA? Oh, EDA is ectothermal dysplasia, uh, which is a, a diffusible morphogen. And then the, the mesenchyma cell have the EDA receptor. And then they are called so because in human, uh, there are a multiple uh, patients with multiple ectothermal dysplasia. And uh, it is because of this gene is not only in that uh, uh, hair, feather, also the tooth. Uh, so, so you can actually have this nice uh, chemical, uh, mechanical cell aggregation and eventually turn off the cacate uh, to explain this more motivated way. So to summarize this part, uh, basically uh, uh, when we do the in vitro reconstitution, they all pop up at the same time. So this is a curing, curing without a global wave. And in this case, in vivo, you have this nice blue wave going out, which in a way explains the sequential appearance, uh, but also give you a much more <coughs> exquisite pattern. Um, that, uh, and another interesting thing that uh, this is headed work is that then he pick up the emu and ostrich and see what happened there. Uh, it's very interesting. They actually do not have EDA wave. And so they, they, they behave like this. Uh, a feather bar pop out at the same time, and there are many, but they are not as regular. And, and, the, and the speculation is that the, the emu ostrich doesn't need to fly. So their Kantu feather does not have to be so regular uh, space. Uh, so I, I think this, this story uh, comes out uh, uh, this way. And, uh, the, I'll talk about next topic, <coughs> the feather part <bar> orientation. <coughs> so it actually comes uh, by sort of uh, accident uh, when we were playing with the X operation. Uh, but we, we cannot do the very early time. We have to do a later time because we are interested in the feather. So most interesting as a control, actually, it shows that the feather part starts to turn. They respond to the electric current. They, they start to turn, I guess you can see. That, I, mean, I mean, they turn very nice. And I think the amazing thing to me at least is that they turn very nicely. It's not just that they become random. Random, okay, you disrupt all the attention mechanism. But here they turn it, you know, like those colored, you, you, you see in the hurricane. You know, that when the hurricane is coming, they draw those, those, those lines. So it suggests that there is a, the electric current uh, influence of feather orientation sort of in the field, in, in the overall way. <coughs> so we say, well, okay, let's be current involved. So how could that happen? <coughs> so first we have to see if there is really a channel activity going on within the feather bar. Uh, so we collaborate with Ming Zhao, who is a Yushi Davis expert on this topic. So he tried to use the vibratory probe, uh, try to see if there is electric current going in or coming out. So very interesting, 
uh, I mean, he eventually goes through the whole the federal part. Show that uh, in the early time, the current is all goes here. But when feather bud starts to elongate, you see that his current starts to come out and, and go in here. Uh, so, so the way we think about it is that the originally all this electric current goes into the body. They all go in and probably come out. The whole body has one electric field. But when feather bud start to start to develop, I'm uh, sorry, start to elongate, uh, you have some channel blocking here. Now you you break the field into the multiple field. Every field you, you have it comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out. So so okay, so we say okay, so let's try to check it out. So we did the uh, the RNA seq uh, on the feather <coughs> epidermis and mesenchyme, and we indeed find out uh, many of these channel related proteins are expressed in the feather mesenchyme cells. And particularly are these voltage gated calcium channel and <coughs> gap junctions, and then also some other uh, channel proteins. And you can see that the gap junction connection is in the feather vessel here very nicely. And also, these different type of the calcium channel are expressed. Uh, in fact, some in epidermis, but we just focus on the vessel uh, So, again, we uh, had to collaborate with the expert. Uh, um, Bob Chow is a physiologist uh, in USC. So we started to, to uh, let, uh, uh, do this uh, measurement uh, using that uh, uh, sheet down, uh, type thing to see the image. So you can see the top one. Uh, they actually have this calcium activity, but also they look like they are synchronized, and then they are moving up. So you can see they are actually synchronized. But uh, if we try to uh, block them, um, that, uh, that <coughs> you, you, you block them, then you can see that uh, they become uh, not synchronized. They become sort of os uh, oscillating. Uh, that, uh, and you can block it either with the calcium channel blocker, if I keep it, or the So that, uh, but, but you can see they start to oscillate here and there. They are not coming up at the same time. <coughs> so that, uh, um, uh, and this is the measurement of that. Uh, so in the control situation, they, they synchronize coming out. Uh, but uh, uh, if you block the calcium channel or get junction, uh, they become oscillated here and there. So what's the consequence though? Uh, so that, uh, you can see that the feather doesn't elongate anymore. Uh, they remain as a so-called short feather bar. Uh, in both cases, rather than elongated to a particular direction. And here, though, then we use the connection uh, 43 SHRNA to block it, and you can see this area, the feather bar, cannot, cannot elongate. Uh, so, uh, that, uh, so what happened? Um, then we decided a cell proliferation or a cell migration, or so we try to uh, uh, use the imaging. And here you can see, uh, in the control time, the cells all goes upstairs, and it's sort of that the, this way, and also posterior. And this is the cell uh, experiment. Uh, but if you block <coughs> the gap junction uh, inhibitor, uh, that uh, you will, this process uh, will fail. The cell starts with <coughs> a granted movement rather than a connective movement. Yes, please. In the previous experiment, what is the time scale of the calcium wave oh, versus yeah. okay. the growth okay. of Yeah, I should say that uh, each movie is nine hours. Okay. In each movie, when you from the beginning to nine hour time period. And this is the same as the time scale for the asymmetry, the elongation of yeah, the body? Yeah, okay. exactly. Yes, yeah. Okay. So that uh, with this uh, inhibitor, now you can see the cell does run them move, and then they stay as a short feather part. <coughs> and then we say, so who is in control of this? So it's uh, interesting that uh, uh, other people also talk about the sonic can coordinate the channel activity. And here we can see sonic epidermis of the distal feather bar 
patch one is right under here in the message pack. And the connection as well is also in this area. Uh, so we, we sort of suspect <coughs> that, and uh, that, uh, then we start to uh, use the cyborg permit to block it, or use the SAG, which is the sonic algorithm. And uh, we were able to show that, uh, um, that uh, in the next slide you can see that uh, this one would actually uh, block this cell migrate, migrate, collective cell migration. And uh, uh, we also found that in the gap junction, uh, the enhancer region, uh, the connection 43 uh, have the uh, GUI binding site and also the left one which bind to the GUI. So we think that uh, because at the time the federal market is forming, Sonic is on this top here, GUI 7A is on the this top uh, posterior epithelial here. So we think we, we sort of did more work to show uh, Sonic can actually induce the gap junction transcription and the GUI 7A can also uh, synergistically help this event, although we think the song is playing a more a major role. And uh, that, uh, uh, this one now shows if you add a cyclopunk, uh, the calcium oscillation you know, rather than synchronized, and the cell movement also becomes like the, uh, rather than collectively directed. Uh, so this song, and uh, uh, that, uh, this is the, the major. So to sum up uh, this part, uh, basically that uh, um, you you have the feather bus growing, and uh, that uh, because of the mesenchyma cell have the calcium channel, uh, when they are ready to elongate, uh, they start to show calcium activity. But originally, this activity oscillate. You know, each mesenchyma cell oscillate on its own. Then when some the hedgehog um, is expressed as strong enough, they come down and then they solid hatch out the diffuse down to make this oscillation coordinated and synchronized. And then this process is gap junction dependent. So now every cell are coordinated and then they move toward the distal end collectively. And if you block uh, at a different place, you block sonic, you block that uh, calcium channel, you block gap junction, and uh, you block this process. Um, and then globally, though, we think that this is why when we pass the electric current, uh, we can uh, uh, convert uh, the orientation connected. Okay, so uh, the, 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 the last example is uh, go back to the physical. Uh, uh, that tissue mechanics. So just uh, taking back, huh? when, when you, you leave taking back, you can always take a look at the skin. A well-made taking back will show you this beautiful network because they have to fly just right so it's your transparent. <laughs> so this is the muscle network. Uh, the bird has, you know, but I don't know how show those are the real, real somatic muscle. These are the so the thermal muscle, um, but still very important. And then that, uh, um, if you take the skin, you flip it over. Uh, this is the muscle network of the other end, maybe. But it's such a beautiful pattern. One would also wonder how do they make these connections? Is it through some blueprint or is it through some local process? Um, and uh, again, uh, this is from the book Lucas Stanton Stanton. So you can see this, I mean, the chicken skin, beautiful muscle network. <laughs> and uh, in reality, you know, in each of the feather, you have the two muscles pull you this way, two muscles pull you the other way. So the hair is different. We only have one muscle. And so when you too cold, they, they stand up. But feather actually has four muscles. <laughs> so our question is that, uh, you know, is this, how, how, is, how do they form? Is it predetermined or they adapt to a local cue, signal cue? Uh, so how would the feather bar be important? And the feather is a chemical or mechanical cue. And when this network is, is disrupted, can they regenerate, reassemble? Uh, because a robustic network uh, should be able to adjust to different conditions. So that uh, uh, here again, we can observe the network uh, in different parts of the body. Uh, so generally, we use the uh, uh, red, uh, uh, this tendency C, uh, which is uh, uh, enriched in the tendon, the C 
skeleton, muscle skeleton, tendon. So that's the grade. From the grade the zone is under the base of each feather follicle. They develop a tendency and an interval in which the site. The green is a smooth muscle actin. Uh, so they represent the muscle cell. So in fact, in different parts of the body, such as in the dorsal skin, you will have almost like a beautiful hexagonal pattern. But in the femoral skin, the density is, is lower, so they form this rectangular shape. And then in between the aptheric region, the distance is so far away, they will not form a muscle network. So we try to um, look into their developmental process. Um, the early embryo, it looks like this, around the, uh, E7, and then go to about E12. Uh, they gradually uh, develop this new anchoring point. It's almost like a tendon of the skeleton, uh, but the dreaded zone is the tenacin and the intergreen and the, the green <coughs> muscle comes in. And the dreaded zone and the green zone comes in, the muscle comes in, the muscle comes in, and this is a three-dimensional uh, view. So we can see that this is almost like a new right connection. But the new right also have to find its target. So in our situation, uh, we find out in originally the SMA positive cells going almost 360 degrees every direction. Uh, but this, very quickly, in one day, they form this beautiful uh, connected uh, pattern. So what is uh, uh, in control? Um, so we originally also try to check out the, some of the chemical uh, diffusible signals that didn't really find that uh, they do many things. And uh, uh, then we also uh, learned that this muscle activity could be very much influenced by the tension. So instead of growing the feather explant on a, collag on a collagen gel here, we purposely uh, sort of uh, dissolved it. So the collagen gel is in float. So when this collagen gel is floating, you lose that mechanical tension, and then the, the muscle fiber cannot, cannot form. Uh, you can see the feather bars are still here. But now, other than the outside, probably have some contraction. The inside, the, the, the muscle network uh, doesn't form. And then we start to say, how about stretching? So in our system, we use this Velcro, uh, Velcro type system, and we can either pull x this way, or pull x this way. So when we pull them anterior <coughs> posterior, uh, you can see that uh, they, you enhance the connection in this way. But when you pull them vertically, you enhance the fiber this direction. So some of the fiber now, instead of going to the anterior neighbor, will actually go, go this direction now. And then we also wonder how uh, these uh, chemical inhibitors will do on them. Uh, so if we had a uh, brevisetin, uh, which inhibits the non muscle myosin, uh, this is what you got. They, they cannot make a beautiful connection like this. And also, uh, if you use the raw, raw inhibitor, you also, this muscle cell get lost. So they are using the tension line as, as a cue. And then when they able to reach the next feather bar through integrity, they become a stable connection. And the other fiber would go on uh, to enhance that connection. And if a fiber finally still not find a partner, he will have to die. Uh, but we try to play with that too. Uh, is that the, in the adult, we try to figure out the regeneration situation. So we purposely upgrade one of the feather bar and see what happened to the muscle fiber uh, in the neighbor feather bar. Uh, what happened to the muscle fiber? So if the feather bar is abraded, actually this muscle mm. fiber originally attached to him will go to find a new partners. So it's this kind of a connection is a, it's a, it's a, it's a homeostatic situation. It's not permanent. So we actually have, a, oh, I didn't show the, the model, but actually a, a Baker, Bruce Baker, help us make a model there. It's suggesting such as about 10% we, we make it up, although we try to make movies to figure it out. But 10% of the fiber was constantly going off and going back. When they're going off, then they have opportunity to, to survey 
the new tension line, and then we'll go to the new tension line. So if you stretch me this way, a fiber coming off 10% would now start to go this direction. And, and, and so, so that is what we think, uh, that uh, um, uh, they are adaptive to regeneration, and uh, the anchor point is the tension C at the integrate, that's how one. So the muscle cell will find their near, nearest neighbor feather bar, and once they make that connection, they stabilize. And the other fiber has to go with them uh, in order to keep that uh, stable connection. And uh, eventually, you have a apparently stable network, but, um, but it's actually dynamic under equilibrium uh, state. So to sum up, uh, that's what I show you now here, is that you form the feather, a plateau, they have to elongate, and then you need this muscle uh, to uh, make them uh, connected. Uh, connected to functional, uh, like what we just heard, people alone is not going to do the job. You need the muscle, you need the nerve, you need the blood vessel. Um, that, um, so today I show you um, these physics principle, reaction diffusion plus some molecular signal, electric signal plus sonic signal, and uh, tension plus energy. And, uh, so I think uh, we do the Mahat homework on uh, feather morphogenesis is that uh, I think that uh, the pattern morphogenesis is so complicated, it's probably not a single process. Mm -hmm. In many cases, the uh, coupling of a local event plus a global event, and it's a molecular signal uh, plus physical force. But physical force is, can be tissue mechanics, can be bioelectric activity, and it can be the Turing pattern. As you know, Turing pattern can happen in the uh, non-biology system uh, as well. So that uh, uh, today's work, uh, a lot of them is done by ND. And uh, by the way, he's really wonderful. He did postdoc in Star Wales uh, Institute, and now he's, uh, he's on the job market looking for assistant P. Uh, really wonderful. And a lot of the pattern work is done by John Chang. And the muscle work is done by Sen Wu and the history of this picture. When you dissociate the dermal cells and reassociate, uh, you get the feather buds, but you also get the global vector polarity. And, um, can, and can you reestablish that with an opposed electric field uh, and so on? Uh, very good point. <laughs> and, uh, yes, you, you reestablish the polarity. Uh, we have not uh, claimed that we consistent with the electric current. But, 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 it, but it, without, the cur without the imposed current, it does spontaneously establish a vector polarity uh, yes. for the dissociated cells? Yes, they will. Uh, and I think they listen to the epidermis. Somehow there is some cue there in the epidermis if there's a formation. Uh, in fact, if I do other experiments, epithelial mesenchyme has with some reaction. Epithelial this way, mesenchyme this way, I turn around and put it back. Now the feather bar. Location is determined by mesenchyme. Orientation is determined by the epidermis. So, now you're right. I mean, there is another level of the question, such as who in the epidermis controls this polarity originally? When they set up, right? or oh, like the, the the work, I was happy to talk about the EDA wave. So, but the, we now we have to see who controls the EDA wave. So, so yeah, so there are a lot of interesting questions. We're here, the back. Yes. So, um, what sets the length scale of the but what sets the length scale of the bad part? Pa Bud patterning. Yes. And how is it changed between you know different species or you know different bud feathers? Yeah. Uh, let's say that typically in the chicken, uh, a feather bud is probably about 200 micrometer in diameter, and uh, when they form, when they form uh, thermal condensation, it actually depends. That's an interesting question. You talk about the different species. Apparently, different species can have a so-called different threshold. Uh, so that uh, when they form the feather bud, they can be different size in different birds. And this activate this threshold can be interpreted as uh, the number 
of activator inhibitor, such as how much FGF BMP you can secrete and how much FGF BMP receptor you have on your body surface. Does mechanics play a role in the things? Well, I think cell adhesion sort of become become the mechanical role, and it is the less threshold between the morphogen secretion and the adhesive strengths. Uh, and somehow when you fall into the range of the Turing activator inhibitor situation, you can kick in. But the Turing doesn't always happen uh, because like in the hair, we're doing that very hard for our NIH project, we're making the human adult cell. Because the new world mouse cells, as you might have seen our paper, they form hair beautifully, periodically. But the adult mouse cannot, but we, we add some of these growth factors. We actually did a PNS beta last year uh, can can make a doubt mouse to grow, but the human we still cannot deal. Yeah. So, I, I guess <coughs> when you do those perturbation with uh, with the electroporation, it's, it's a very short time scale perturbation. Yet you get you get this you're right, you're pattern. Right. So uh, and and the, the yeah, feather yeah, appear yeah. in order with a period of nine hours. So. What is your idea yeah. for the coordination? Uh, this, you know, this puzzle, this puzzle is more than years. Um, I, I should also say the exact operation of when the feather is pointing this way, the effect I have to do is exact operation this direction, <coughs> this direction, then they turn. Okay. <coughs> if I do that in this direction, right, they don't really care. And if I do uh, this direction, actually it's become very powerful index operation, meaning the genes will get in. But they have to change. Uh, and then how, how is that memory kept? Uh, I, I, I actually love to have input. I, I have been, that's why we do that calcium channel work. Uh, and we kind of identify part of the story. But, but you're right, that's a wonderful question. Yeah. So, yeah, I was thinking about the last part of your talk with the, the muscle guidance. And yeah. the data suggests that you develop tension between these these feather buds and the muscle traffics along those regions. But I also remember that you showed data once, I don't think it was today, that you also get the sort of alignment of collagen fibers yes. between those yes. buds as they as they condense. And I was wondering, is it what's the right way to think about those muscle fibers trafficking? Is it yeah. along no, those that, fibers? That's a wonderful question too. Actually that that, that one Stu, Stuart a very long time ago already observed collagen uh, fiber in these feather buds. But they, they think that the, the mesenchyma cells travel <laughs> on the collagen fiber to, to make thermal condensation. But, but you think about it, the, well, the question you just asked is actually, is actually most fundamental. Who is first? I think the thermal cell have to start the random. So this collagen gel are not, collagen fiber alignment are not there originally. So how do they get aligned? Right? That's a wonderful question. And now with the so-called 4D imaging and this uh, second harmonic, we are sort of in a position to start to see how the reaction diffusion talk to the collect the ECM alignment. And I would think actually the smooth muscle is after the collagen fiber. Yeah. This sort of gets at the question about the time scale of electrical experiment. Um, going back to Sanjel, I mean, he showed a wonderful picture where um, if you strip away the, the ectoderm, you actually see fibroblasts already forming a pre-pattern of where a cell, of where the, the feather buds will, will form. And they actually track some of these collagen molecules, right? So collagen happens to be one of the most electrically potential uh, extracellular mm -hmm. structure yeah. around. So if you shift the polarity by electroporation, could this be shifting a pre-pattern that you then see manifest through the formation of the feather buds later on? Yeah, I mean, that's a good thought, but I think that in our system, though, uh, those collagen fiber form would be much later. Would be much later. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have said, when we see this events for any effect, actually our first candidate is PCP, Prana Cellular Polarity. So we try to look for them, and also because that, uh, um, that, that they show that free those six mutants in the mouse, the hair actually run them oriented. But, uh, but PCB genes are not expressed at this time. Yeah, interestingly, it's actually after the feather bud come out, then they start to be expressed. So, so this PCB is not involved, and the collagen fiber also is a later event. Yeah, quick question. So we attributed the pattern formation to Turing patterning. Do you think lateral inhibition has a role in oh, there? 
Yeah, definitely. The, I mean, the, the tuning pattern, you need to let the lateral inhibition. Otherwise, you, it holds a sheet, or you have some lateral, it becomes stripes, and you right. have it just right, then it's a periodic, periodic arrangement. Yeah, but their motifs are quite different in terms of like morphogens. Yeah, what? Their motifs are different, like interaction motifs. So, do you think that like the start is with ring patterning and then the propagation is with letter inhibition? Or? Yeah, yeah. Well, the letter inhibition can come in many different ways. It could be morphology, it could be the cell cell contact, it could be the mechanical force as we now appreciate it. I mean, curing activator inhibitor, I think, should be looked this way. So the cell really care is they, they just count all the sum, the sum of all activators, whether in form of uh, morphogen adhesion or uh, uh, the, the mechanical force. And the similar the inhibitor, they, they count it and then they do the, their decision. Okay, so. Okay, so I think we should uh, break here and uh, thank you again in uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.